Okay, so welcome back to week eight of the introduction to to the introduction to fluid mechanics course, and this is the problem solving session for the this is the problem solving session for the course, and in this week's problem solving session, we will be again dealing with the applications of Bernoulli's equation. So in previous week, we have looked in detail about the derivation and the details involved in the consideration of Bernoulli's equation to solve <coughs> any fluid flow problem. We looked that there are some strict assumptions that need to be made for the validity of the Bernoulli's equation, namely it being a constant density flow, an inviscid flow, a steady flow and a flow along a streamline. But also we saw that this assumption of flow being along a streamline can be uh, disregarded if we can prove that the given flow is irrotational. Okay, so these were the primary assumptions or the fundamental assumptions that are needed to be satisfied before the application of Bernoulli's equation to solve any kind of fluid flow problem. So in this week, rather than going to the uh, fundament, uh, go going to the origins of the uh, Bernoulli's equation and how it was derived or obtained, we will rather look into the various fields or various types of problems upon which uh, the Bernoulli's equation can be applied to, to get a meaningful understanding of the physics of the problem. Okay, so, uh, so let's just directly dive into some of the problems that uh, Professor Chakraborty has discussed in the uh, lectures. So the first problem being regarding the draining of a uh, draining of a fluid from a orifice. Okay. So in this diagram, in this diagram, there is basically a orifice or a hole at the bottom of the tank, and through which the fluid is draining out. Okay. The fluid is draining out. Okay. And <coughs> we now try to apply the Bernoulli's equation to find the time required to drain the tank. Like this is one of the, uh, I guess this, this is the end goal of our objective. That is we want to find the time required for to drain the tank. But moreover, we will also find out the uh, velocity at the exit and such kind of parameters by the application of Bernoulli's equation in two different points of the given geometry. Okay. So let's consider some assumptions that are that are involved while approaching the problem. So the thing is that this problem has already been, has already been discussed by Professor Chakraborty in the lectures. But uh, going through our uh, common agenda that we follow in these problem solving sessions, then I will just try to uh, revise the concepts discussed by Professor Chakraborty, and then we will look into the problems related to the. Uh, uh, lectures of that given week so that you are able to solve the uh, questions that are given in the assignments of that particular week okay so that's the protocol for our problem solving session that, that has been carried out uh, from the beginning of the course so we we'll stick to that okay so the assumptions that we take are that the flow is in viscid and density is constant so by applying the unsteady Bernoulli's equation because right now we have not uh, mentioned that the flow is steady so by applying the unsteady Bernoulli's equation uh, we get that p1 by rho plus v1 square by 2 plus gz1 is equal to p2 by rho plus v2 square by 2 plus gz2 plus the unsteady term okay integration of from 1 to 2 dou v by dou t ds okay now by applying the continuity equation between points 1 and 2 Okay. Uh, if we apply the continuity equation between point 1 and 2, basically this point 1 and point 2, we can write this a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2. Okay. So, uh, just, uh, just a minute. Oh, just, uh, sorry for the delay. So, it's an urgent thing that I need to take. Sorry for the delay, so just a second.
okay so uh, once we apply Bernoulli's equation we can deduce this Bernoulli sorry for the delay I'm very sorry for the delay so from this continuity equation if we now deduce or simplify the uh, 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 write the expression for area in these two expressions that a area a1 would basically be pi d1 square by 4 and a2 would be pi d2 square by 4 so once we do that substitute the uh, expression for area in this expression we can simplify the continuity equation to v1 d1 square plus v2 d2 square where d1 and d2 are diameters of uh, of the surface of the upper order outer or upper surface of the uh, tank and d2 corresponds to the diameter of the hole okay through which the liquid has been is being drained okay so uh, from the diagram we can write v1 is equal to d minus dh by dt right because the velocity by which the liquid drains uh, out would basically be the rate at which the <coughs> height of the uh, the height of the level of the liquid uh, decreases in the tank okay so uh, in the unsteady term then this unsteady term can then be simplified as dv1 by dt h uh, uh, dv by uh, dv1 by uh, dv1 by dt into ht where h is a function of time okay so uh, there's a certain assumption uh, involved while simplifying this term from uh, this to this that we take dv1 by dt to be constant why because the streamlines remain parallel for uh, the for most of the <coughs> distance or the depth of the tank and it's only in the bottom part near the orifice or the hole where the streamlines converge in order to uh, reorient themselves to take into account a change in the area of cross section okay so uh, so DV, uh, DV, this term dv1 by dt can essentially be taken to be constant and thus can be taken out of the integration to simplify this term into dv1 by dt into dv1 by dt into ht okay so uh, once we uh, <coughs> implement this simplification into the Bernoulli's equation we can write uh, v in the answer to the Bernoulli's equation we can write v2 square minus v1 square by 2 plus z g z2 minus z1 is equal to minus dv1 by dt into h okay so let now let us consider uh, these two terms as a and b say okay so here we are basically trying to understand the significance of these terms in the uh, Bernoulli's equation like what does what significance it holds uh, or, or what's the order magnitude of these terms so that if that <coughs> one of the terms is quite small compared to the other one then we can neglect that, that term to simplify the problem even further okay just a step to simplify the uh, problem that we have in our hand okay so let us consider these two terms to be a and b respectively and if say the term b that is dv1 by, dv1 by dt into h is much much smaller than the term gh okay then we can essentially neglect this term right this term can essentially be neglected compared to these two terms so now the Bernoulli's equation will basically be the balance between these two terms okay so for the limit of this term b being <coughs> much much lesser than a we would have v2 square by v2 square minus v1 square by 2 is equal to gh now if we apply the continuity equation that is v1 d1 square is equal to v2 d2 square that remember that this is not a general form the general form is basically v1 a1 is equal to v2 a2 but given that we know the geometry and the geometry is basically a cylinder so the area of cross section will basically of the flow would basically depend upon the diameter of the uh, cross section or the cylindrical cross section through which the flow passes right that's why we can just simplify it into v1 d1 square into v2 d2 square okay so if we substitute v2 in terms of v1 in this equation then we can write v1 by 2 bracket d, d uh, capital d square by small d square minus 1 is equal to gh okay this is a simple simplification substituting v2 in this expression okay so one more thing that you can catch is that like when is the scenario that this term would be small so this term would essentially be small when the rate at which the liquid <coughs> discharges or uh, flows out of the tank is much much uh, slower or essentially very slow compared to uh, uh, the 
order of magnitude of this term okay so if the rate with which the or if we essentially if the velocity of the flow remains constant then this term can be essentially be neglected then this term will be very very small compared to this the term gh okay so in that scenario the boundary equation can essentially be taken as the balance between these two terms okay basically the kinetic head and the potential head okay so uh, <coughs> Then from this expression, we can write V1 as C into root 2 GH, where C can be taken, the constant C can be taken as the, uh, as this expression, this 1 by D, capital D square by small D square minus 1 to the power half, where D is the diameter of the cross section of the tank and small D is the diameter of the hole through which the liquid is draining, okay. And since we know that DH by DT is equal to V1, because if we go back here, uh, we have taken that assumption this v1 is equal to uh, dh by dt right the rate at which sorry the rate at which the upper surface of the upper surface of the tank uh, moves down is basically equal to the rate at which the height of the fluid reduces in the tank so uh, if we go back here then we can just substitute the expression of v1 in this expression that dh by dt that dh by dt is equal to v1 then from that we will get that minus dh by dt is equal to c into root 2gh okay now once we if we integrate this expression <coughs> with respect to t then we will basically then we can basically find out the time required to drain the tank completely okay okay then we look into a second example and it's one of the very uh, crucial applications of Bernoulli's equation or the principle of Bernoulli's equation in our day to day life that is basically the principle of siphon okay so if we <coughs> want to drain this uh, fluid using a pipe raised to a certain height that is the upper the high, uh, hi highest point of the pipe being above the surface of the liquid and the point through which the liquid or the fluid exits is below the uh, free surface of the fluid then essentially the liquid can be drained out of the tank using the principle of Bernoulli's okay principle of Bernoulli's equation okay so uh, if we now if we apply in this diagram uh, if we apply the Bernoulli's equation between point one that is near the that is near the entrance of the pipe and is at the uh, and is at the free surface and point two being at the uh, inner region at, at this point of the pipe this is one of the inner regions of the pipe it is located at the uh, highest point up to which the pipe has been raised then the Bernoulli's equation between these two points can be considered as p1 by rho plus v1 square by 2 plus gz1 is equal to p2 by rho plus v2 square by 2 plus gz2 okay now since point 1 is exposed to the free surface then we can consider this to be the atmospheric pressure right and since the rate at which the liquid discharges is quite insignificant compared to the area of the tank. Now, if we take that assumption, then we can basically consider V1 to be equivalent to zero. Okay, I'm not saying it's exactly equal to zero because there is a certain change in the height of the fluid, but still, compared to the other terms, the net value or the net magnitude of this term is much much smaller compared to other terms, and that's why this term can be essentially be neglected and we can say that this term is almost equal to zero okay so once we do that we can take this term to be zero then uh, then we deal with the remaining terms that is basically these four terms okay now if we apply the continuity equation between point two and the exit then v2 would be equal to v exit because the a because area a2 is equal to the area of the exit right Simple application of the continuity equation v1 a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 since a2 and v a exit are same then v2 is equal to v exit okay so and if we approximate the exit velocity to be say around uh, root 2 gh like that's just a crude approximation that but can essentially give us a lot of idea regarding like it can it acts as a good approximation for the exit velocity but is still for now it's just an assumption okay just an approximation not an assumption but an, a good approximation for the current scenario okay so once we uh, 
deal with the remaining terms of the Bernoulli's equation, we can rearrange them to write as P2 by rho is equal to minus GH minus V exit square by 2. So basically, we take these two terms in the right hand side. So since Z1 is less than Z2, then we will have a negative height, that is minus ne negative potential height, that is basically equal to minus GH and V2 square <coughs> by 2, since when it goes to the uh, uh, left hand side, it becomes minus V exit v, v exit square by 2. Okay, and since both of these terms are, uh, these terms individually are positive, so uh, the neg negative sign basically implies that the pressure P2 is essentially negative compared to the atmospheric pressure. So basically there is a suction pressure at the point P2, which basically is the driving force behind sucking this fluid out of <coughs> this uh, out of the surf from this out of this tank and uh, pumping it out from the exit <coughs> point okay from the exit point but again <coughs> this problem as like as simple as it seems but, but actually in real life it comes with uh, lots of uh, consider uh, lots of uh, losses involved while uh, draining uh, like in real life there are lots of losses involved while draining the fluid out of the tank of out of a tank using siphon right primarily there will be head losses in the pipes that we will eventually see in the later part of the code that there are head losses in the pipe because of friction and uh, moreover there is again curvatures this uh, curvature in the pipe that again causes then ag that again causes uh, minor losses in the in this uh, pipe so there are various losses involved which es essentially uh, affect the net flow rate from the exit of the pipe okay so we look into that but this uh, approximation or this example is basically used to uh, teach us or like look used to use an example or use as a first hand example for the principle of uh, or working principle of a siphon okay so i hope it was clear then uh, let us look into one of the one of the three uh, I guess uh, flow measuring devices that we are going to study in today's session. That is, at first is pitot tube, then, uh, then there is the venturi meter and orifice meter. Okay, so these are the three uh, flow measuring devices that we are going to use, and where the venturi meter and orifice meter are essentially used to measure the flow rate through a particular duct or pipe but uh, the main principle of or main uh, use of pitot tube is to measure the velocity of the flow at a particular point in the flow field okay so it's a very important uh, what to say uh, thing to remember like there's, there are lots of time there are questions comes in the, there, there can be questions in the competitive exams regarding the main purpose behind the use of pitot tube in flow measuring device in flow measuring devices so the main parameter that the pitot tube measures is actually the velocity of the flow and venturi meter and orifice meter essentially are used to measure the flow rate that is the volume flow rate q in a particular duct or uh, pipe okay so uh, let us look into the working principle of a pitot tube so this consider this following diagram Okay, where this denotes a static tube and this denotes a pitot tube. Okay, we will look into it how they are different. So, so in this case, uh, the static tube essentially measures the static pressure where the static tube, static tube can be considered to be a, a piezometer in the flow uh, uh, attached in the duct where the, whereas the pitot tube is essentially used to measure the stagnation pressure okay why is the stagnation pressure we look into it or what is stagnation pressure we look into that okay so static pressure is essentially the pressure that is experienced by the moving uh, experience in moving with the flow okay so and the stagnation pressure is basically the pressure at a point where the fluid is brought to rest in a reversible and adiabatic manner okay so here the pressure that this being measured at the static tube is, is basically the static pressure okay that is being generated or that is being uh, measured because of the flow of the fluid from the duct okay like how the like for example when we considered the 
example of uh, pi uh, of manometer we saw that the flow of the fluid results in different readings or different levels of fluid or different levels of uh, readings in the manometer right and this difference in reading is basic essentially because of the pressure difference that exists between the two points that actually actuates or initiates the flow right so it is the motion of the fluid through the duct that has resulted in the uh, change in the levels of fluid in the uh, manometer or piezometer so this is what actually that flow measuring device this particular flow measuring device measures that is a static tube so that is the flow of the liquid that generates or that creates a certain reading in the uh, static tube that <coughs> that is what <coughs> that that we actually perceive as the static pressure okay so uh, just a second okay I'm extremely sorry but just kindly wait for a few seconds I'm extremely sorry for a delay, so I had to deal with uh, some uh, things. So just to basically just to arrange the room that I'm sitting in. So I'm extremely sorry for the delay. Okay. So uh, yes. <coughs> so in the case of uh, uh, static tubes or piezometers or manometers, <laughs> what they basically measure is the uh, deflection in the height generated in the fluid because of the motion of the flow, motion of the fluid through that particular duct. Okay. But in the case of a pitot tube, what's different or essentially different compared to what uh, this static tube measures is that the, uh, the deflection in the height of the liquid in the pitot tube is essentially because of the fact that the flow at the entrance of the pitot tube is essentially being uh, stopped or essentially being uh, stopped to almost zero velocity at the entrance of the pitot tube that what basically uh, helps us to measure the static pressure as well as the dynamic uh, pressure in the uh, flow which essentially gives us whose sum essentially gives us the stagnation pressure okay so we look into and and this fact can be very beautifully being be understood by looking into the Bernoulli's equation being applied between points two and three in the flow okay so let us look into that so let me just again revise the what stagnation pressure basically means so it is the pressure at a point where the fluid is being brought to rest in a reversible and adiabatic manner okay so if we apply the Bernoulli's equation let me just zoom out a bit more so if we apply the Bernoulli's equation between point 2 and 3 so what we will essentially see is that since they are at the same level so there is no change in the kind of uh, potential head so this Z, Z2 and Z3 term to be neglected. Okay, so once we apply the Bernoulli's equation, we can write P2 by rho plus B2 square by 2 is equal to P3 by rho plus B3 square by 2. Okay, and since we have told that we have stopped the flow to have a zero velocity at the entrance of the pitot tube, so V3 is equal to zero. Okay, V3 is equal to zero, and that essentially means that that point is considered to be the stagnation point. Why? Because the flow has been reduced to a velocity zero, or essentially the flow is. Uh, made stagnant at that particular point and hence the name stagnation point okay so p3 now can essentially be written as p2 plus half rho v2 square okay and since velocity at point 3 is 0 so and since the Bernoulli's equation has to be satisfied so the pressure at point 3 is essentially the sum of the static pressure p2 plus the dynamic pressure because of the motion of the flow okay and that's why stagnation pressure can be essentially written as the sum of static pressure and the dynamic pressure okay so uh, i hope that was clear so now let us look into the venturi meter okay so
so uh, in the ventimeter again so there are various uh, uh, physics involved in the very construction of the ventimeter like as this uh, i have not taken that uh, those notes or those specifications into account while preparing today's uh, session because i feel that uh, those are things that could be uh, looked upon uh, that are that those are conceptual things and can be essentially be looked upon by uh, looked upon by revising the video lectures of professor chakravarti or even following some standard film mechanics books but still uh, there are some details that are given uh, and mentioned professor chakravarti himself like regarding the very specific shape or design of the venturi meter itself like why for example why the con converging uh, part of the venturi meter is smaller than the diverging section right why the length of the converging section is uh, comparatively smaller than the diverging section right and why this angle of convergence in this part is comparatively higher than the angle of convergence a divergence at the diverging part okay so i know they are interrelated but still uh, like obviously the angle of convergence divergence is higher than this length will essentially uh, go down right but still why this design has been specifically specifically being made like, and what are the losses that are involved in, in involved in venturi meter that we are essentially neglecting in some problems to simplify the problem right uh, simplify the uh, approach to solve the problem okay so there are various specifics involved in the very design of venturi meter itself so that can be looked upon or revised upon uh, by the students by revising the lectures okay so i i, I have skipped that part but that part is also essential like questions from that part are also very common in competitive exams so i insist that you look back to the lectures and see the design factor or design process or design ideology involved in the construction of a venturi meter okay so now consider this diagram that uh, and where point 1 lies at the entrance of the venturi meter and point 2 lies at the throat of the venturi meter and these two the pressure at these two points are being measured using a u tube manometer okay and say the measure uh, the measuring fluid for this pressure in the manometer is mercury okay so if we apply now bernoulli's equation between point 1 and 2 so we can write p1 rho p1 by rho plus v1 square by 2 plus gz1 is equal to p2 by rho plus v2 square by 2 plus gz2 okay and uh, now if we use the principle of manometry we know that point a and point b will be at the same will have the same pressure because they are at the same elevation level then we can just uh, uh write the necessary steps or measure the net uh pressure because of the liquid column above these two points considering a b to be the datum to find that p p1 by rho g plus z1 minus p2 by rho g plus z2 is equal to the density of mercury upon the density of the fluid minus 1 into delta h where delta is basically the deflection in the or difference in the height of the uh, mercury with respect to the datum okay then if we apply from equation star the equation star if we simplify this we can write p1 by rho g plus z1 minus p2 by rho g plus z2 is equal to v2 square minus v1 square by 2g okay so this just derive from this uh from the bernoulli equation right so from the principle of manometry or from the measurement of the pressures using the uh principle of manometry we can find we found we found that p1 by rho g plus z1 minus p2 by rho g plus z2 is equal to rho m by rho minus 1 into delta h okay so if we substitute now this into this expression then we can essentially write uh, rho m by rho minus 1 into delta h would be equal to v2 square minus v1 square by 2g okay so this was the idea behind it and now if we <coughs> use the continuity equation between the points 1 and 2 of the venturi meter then we can write v1 is equal to q by a1 and v2 is equal to q by a2 and if we substitute that in this expression we will get that q square by 2g in bracket 1 by a2 square minus 1 by a1 square is equal to rho m by rho minus 1 is equal to delta h okay into delta h okay so now if we just uh, simplify this equation even further and represent q in terms of all the uh, known parameters here then we can write q is equal to a2 
into square root of 2g square root of 2g by 1 minus a2 square by a1 square into delta p into rho g see all of the terms are known here like uh, since a2 can be easily be know, known by knowing the, the dimensions of the venture meter because that will already be mentioned by the manufacturer themselves g is a constant rho, rho is a constant and delta p is the only thing that we have to measure that can be easily be obtained be obtained using the manometer right we can obtain we can obtain delta p using the YouTube manometer. So that is the only parameter that we need to measure in order to find the flow rate through the venturi meter. Okay. So similar to the construction of venturi meter, there there is another flow measuring or or specifically if, if I'm going to say a flow rate measuring device known as the orifice meter. Okay. So in the case of or orifice meter, uh, just one minute. Just uh, one Extremely solid before this. Okay, so I am extremely sorry, I have to uh, leave the session, I have to take an important call, so I am extremely sorry for the delay, so I apologize for that. Okay. So uh, going back to the <coughs> orifice uh, meter, so orifice meter is a similar device that is that is used to measure the flow rate through a particular duct or pipe and given the simplicity in the design, it is much uh, cheaper to construct or manufacture compared to a venturi meter but again it also comes with their own uh, uh, cons like there are several uh, inaccuracy involved in the measuring of flow rate through a orifice meter but for large scale measurements or like or the scenarios where the accuracy is not important but the very uh, or the very budget of construction is far more important than the accuracy of measurement of flow rates, then, then orifice meter can be considered to be a very viable uh, option uh, for measuring the flow rate to any duct or pipe. Okay, and, it's, and it is being essentially used in large pipelines that are invo that are involved in the uh, involved in, <coughs> involved in the transfer of liquid from <coughs> one point to another in say refineries or uh, various. Uh, uh, process industries so something like that uh, uh, so, uh, and other interesting in industries like that so orifice meters are essentially being used to measure the uh, flow rates or give an idea of to get a, to get an idea of the amount of fluid that is being passed through a particular uh, uh, pipe uh, for uh, uh, for a particular period of time okay basically to get the uh, volume flow rate so <coughs> that's uh, uh, that's all regarding the uh, applications of orifice meter but let us look into the uh, construction and the uh, principles used while measure for measuring the uh, volume flow rate through the by the help of orifice meter okay so as discussed by professor chakraborty i again i will not go into detail of each and every point in the uh, each and every point in the orifice meter but i will just go, go uh, revise it a bit so that it is easy for you to 
understand are easy for you to understand or revise the concept and recollect the concept that is that was discussed by professor chakravarti and then apply it on the problem that we are going to discuss in today's session okay so uh, consider this diagram where uh, this dashed line basically represents a inner ring like if if it, if it is a if it is a cross section of the orifice meter then there is an inner ring now through it is through this uh, hole that the fluid now passes okay so basic this ring basically denotes i will just try to draw it so this so that it's a bit easy to understand so now if we try to look at a 3d uh, diagram of a orifice meter so it will basically be so then if the flow is initially there so it will now pass through this orifice meter and then again so go through here see and then diverge out okay so this is what uh, orifice meter basically means so there is an inner ring or a valve types i will not say actually valve but an inner blockage within the pipe that results in the con Con convergence of the uh, streamlines that eventually converts to the smallest area uh, converts to a point known as the vena contractor vena contractor where the area of this stream tube is the smallest okay is the smallest then what we essentially do is that now we apply uh, the bernoulli's equation between these points between the point 1 and point c where c is the point at the vena contractor okay so vena contractor is a is the point where the the area of the stream tube of this particular flow is the smallest okay now if we apply a bernoulli's equation between point 1 and c we will get that p1 by rho g plus v1 square by 2g plus z1 is equal to pc by rho g plus vc square by 2g plus zc okay now if we again apply the principle of manometry between the points 1 and sorry i have to use uh, points 1 and point c and now you may ask like how we find point c okay so again since this is a device that is being used for a very long time so there are various various empirical methods to find the locations of the vena contractor like of course it's very difficult to visualize or use various uh, proper flow, flow measuring techniques to find the vena contractor but uh it it can be a bit challenging at the large scale but since this this device had been used for a very long period of time in the industries and in the in the fluid mechanics uh field so the engineers have the originators and scientists have developed various methods empirical methods to determine the relationship between the say the diameter of the pipe and the distance of the vena contractor from the orifice meter okay when this is basically the orifice meter this device okay so they 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 have developed a relationship between the distance of the vena contractor with respect to the diameter of the say the diameter of the uh pipe or say diameter of the hole of the vena contractor okay. so there are various empirical methods that they have developed and this is with, this is how they have uh, they can say that given if like if say small d is the diameter of the orifice meter then i can say that this vena contractor is a this is at a distance of say some constant some constant multiple of the di diameter d okay so this is how they place the uh, uh <coughs> the uh opening of the manometer in the uh, duct to measure the pressure at the vena contractor okay so now again if we apply the principle of manometry between point 1 and c then we can write uh then we can is easily write p1 by rho g plus z1 minus pc by rho g plus zc is equal to delta h into rho m by rho minus 1 okay now we again okay now we again apply the continuity equation between points 1 and uh, c so that we can write a1 b1 into ac is ac is a1 b1 is equal to ac into bc okay so uh so now again 
there, there is an again there is a relationship between the actual uh, velocity at the uh, vela contractor and the theoretical velocity uh, that that exists at the vela contractor okay so that the theoretical velocity at the vela contractor and the actual velocity at the vela contractor is related by the co coefficient of velocity cv so now q actual can be written as vc actual into ac okay because this say this is the theoretical velocity now we substitute this uh, vc we see by the actual uh, velocity of the vena contractor using this relation to write uh, vc actual uh, q actual is equal to vc actual into ac where v <coughs> vc actual would be equal to cv into vc theoretical right so we can write q actual is equal to vc theoretical into cv into ac by a naught into a naught we basically multiply and divide by a naught so that we can again there is a uh, constant uh, the a constant value for ac by a naught known as the coefficient of con con contract uh, coef uh, coefficient of contraction or contraction coefficient which again has some uh, particular values for a for a particular uh, orifice meter given by the particular manufacturer which has been again found by using various empirical methods okay so now you may ask like why you are substituting uh, vc actual or vc theoretical because because this all the analysis that we use using boundary equation or precision manometry are actually gives us the theoretical velocity because we are not taking into account various uh, <coughs> actual scenario various physical parameters that may that may occur or exist in the real life world right say the friction the loss because of the exist the very existence of orifice of this orifice at the at the duct so there are various losses involved right and we are disregarding it by simply using the boundary equation between the two points okay but certainly there will be some losses so in order to take in order to take account those losses we you, we take the help of certain coefficients such as the coefficient of velocity or coefficient of discharge or in the case of entrymeter or coefficient of uh, contraction in the case of an you know, orifice meter okay so once we do that we can write q is equal to a naught into vc theoretical into cc into cv okay this term this will become cc so cc into cv where cc into cv is actually the cd or the coefficient of discharge okay for a particular orifice meter which usually has a range between 0.65 to 0.7 okay now uh, and this a naught comes from this expression because we have multiplied and divided a naught uh, here so it is initially ac but we multiplied and divided a naught so uh, vc theoretical exists that we can find from the boundary equation and the principle of manometry cv exists and this gives us cc so cv into cc gives us the coefficient of discharge cd for an orifice meter and a naught exists because of the additional uh, multiplication and division that we have done to obtain the coefficient of contraction okay so this is that is how a naught comes into picture so i hope this expression is clear So again, I guess I will wait for uh, two minutes so that you can uh, and, uh, digest or take in whatever we have, whatever we have discussed today. So uh, because it is uh, from 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 the discussion that we had uh, up till now, it is that, that uh, by the discussion that we have uh, that we have had till now, it is through from them only we are, we are going to ask some questions for the. Uh, current week's uh, session that would help you in that would in turn help you to solve the problems of this week's assignments okay so i'll give you two minutes to look back or uh, take in uh, or revise the concept that we have discussed till now and then we can start with the problems for this week's session okay
okay so <coughs> i believe uh, uh, now we can uh, go and discuss with discuss uh, this week's uh, questions that are going to help you to uh, solve the so similar type of questions that has been asked in this week's assignments okay so let's go to the first question so i believe this is a very simple question a simple uh, conceptual question so the so the question here that is asked is uh, <coughs> let me zoom it a bit any hydraulic equipment can be damaged seriously due to cavitation if the pressure of the liquid flowing through the equipment becomes lower than the atmospheric at any point during its flow okay for a siphon shown in the figure below identify the location at which the cavitation is most likely to occur okay so uh, i guess it's a very simple straightforward answer like we just look into it, the principle of working principle of siphon that when we apply boundary equation between point a and b say point a and b then we get to know that it is at point b that will that we will have the highest suction pressure okay so from that uh, principle we can easily say that since point b would have the highest suction pressure that's why the most the point that has the most likely chance to have a cavitation uh, that, that, that is most likely to have cavitation is point b because it has the highest uh, it is the highest suction pressure okay so the correct answer would be c that is point b okay so it's again a simple straightforward uh, question just if, if like if you just know the principle of uh working principle of siphon you easily and you easily be able to answer it but something that i can i can i encourage you to look again and again and so that it stays imprinted in your brain okay so let's look into the second question for a liquid flowing through a closed duct which of the following is true okay for a liquid flowing through a closed duct which of the following is true so first first is a pitot tube can measure i'm sorry a pitot tube can measure both stagnation pressure and static pressure again this is not true because we have seen that in the case of a pitot tube it can only measure the stagnation pressure because since the velocity of the fluid at the entrance of the static static uh, sorry at the entrance of the same uh, pitot static tube is zero that's why the net deflection of the fluid that occurs is the static pressure as well as the dynamic pressure right the sum of the static pressure as well as dynamic pressure so the pitot static uh, the static tube the pitot tube would only be able to measure the uh stagnation pressure but in the case of a pitot static tube since it has the holes around its uh outer periphery as well which again help to measure the static pressure that's why pitot static tube can help to measure the stagnation pressure as well as the static pressure in the particular flow field okay but in the case of pitot tube it can only measure the stagnation pressure so option b is correct but let us see the other options as well like option b is the correct answer that's for sure that it measures only the stagnation pressure okay a pitot tube measures the value of the volum volumetric flow rate okay so no as i mentioned uh, pitot tube is specifically being used to measure the velocity of the flow in a particular flow field okay to measure the static pressure the axis of the tube is parallel to the boundary of the duct okay then again <coughs> that's not the case in, for in order to measure a static pressure we see that the taps for the <coughs> manometer or the piezometer are usually perpendicular to the direction of the flow and it is how they measure the static pressure so again this is wrong okay so the only correct option is option b so now let us look into question number three okay so water flows at the rate of 0.05 meter meter cube per second through a 120 millimeter diameter orifice 
used in a 360 millimeter pipe diameter pipe okay find a difference in pressure head between the upstream section and the vena contractor section given that the coefficient of contraction is 0 0.6 and coefficient of velocity is 1.0 okay so this again a very straightforward application of the Bernoulli's equation and like if we if you are able to recall the derivation that we did while discussing uh, the orifice meter i think it will be very easy for you to uh, answer this question but uh, nevertheless let's uh, look into the options let's let's look into the solution how we are how we will be able to solve it so okay it I, I really like to give you a few moments to look into the question and then we can discuss the solution of the problem okay so it's very simple just look into the derivation that was involved while we were discussing in the uh, application of Bernoulli's equation in in the case of orifice meter to find a uh, volume uh, to find a volume flow rate through the orifice meter so if you go, go back to that expression you will easily be able to find the solution for it because since the flow rate is already being given the only unknown term here is the pressure head difference so it is basically pressure head will basically be delta b by rho g okay so this is the pressure head so this one you need to find okay Okay then, uh, I guess we can uh, now try to solve the problem. So let us look into the solution. Okay. So I hope you are able to take the details from the question. So I can discuss it now here. So the volume flow rate was given to be 0.015 meter cube per second. Okay. The diameter of the vena uh, vena contractor, if I'm not wrong. Sorry, I'm really sorry. The diameter of the orifice meter was given to 120 millimeter, and the diameter of the pipe in which this orifice meter has been fit is 360 millimeter. Okay, the coefficient of contraction is 0 0.6, and the coefficient of velocity is 1.0. So now, and we are asked to find the pressure head difference between the upstream section and the vena contractor. Okay, with upstream section with respect to the orifice meter and the vena contractor, okay, which obviously lies in the downstream with respect to the orifice meter so uh, i will not go back to the detailed uh, derivation of uh, these expressions because this can easily be this can be easily found out by, uh, uh, by just simply modifying the Bernoulli's equation so i will leave that as an exercise for you all but still let us look into the problem okay so the volume flow rate through the orifice meter can be given by c into square root of delta p by rho g okay where now capital C is actually giving, being given by CV into CC into A0 where A0 is the area of the orifice meter multiplied by 2G square root of 2G divided by 1 minus CC square A0 square by A1 square okay and since all these terms are constant so these are clubbed together as a constant C okay so I will not uh, uh, go back and show you how this has been these terms have been derived so just as a clue, uh, you can look into this uh, this this equation. Okay, and uh, let me go back. And this expression that we derived for the venturi meter. Okay. And just see how the area of vena contractor and area of orifice meter are related, and how we can correlate that that relation between the area of orifice meter and the area of vena contractor with the area of the pipe. Okay. Try to look into that relation, then you will get to know what uh, I was mentioning about. Again, now you can here clearly see that there is an area term. Also, there is this term square root of root uh, square root of two g by one minus some ratio of area. So try to correlate that in the case of orifice meter. Then you will be able to find the similar expression that I have uh, uh, mentioned here. Okay, so I leave that, leave that as an exercise for all of you. And now, A0 by A1 would basically be the 
ratio between the squares of the diameter of the uh, of the orifice meter and the pipe right so since a0 is uh, the d1 is 120 and d capital d is 360 so its ratio is 1 by 3 and since a are very the square then it will basically be 1 by 3 whole square okay the ratio of a0 by a1 would be equal to 1 by 9 then now a0 is equal to pi by 4 d square because we know small d then we can write a0 is equal to pi by 4 into 0.12 square okay now if we substitute these values of these known terms into this expression for q we will get that so, so first of all let us find c then if we substitute the values of these known values uh, known terms in the expression for c we will get that capital c is equal almost equivalent to 0 0.03 okay this is just simple substitution i am not going to derive each and every uh, term here so uh, you can do it and it's a good exercise to do that okay and now we look in we again come back to the expression that uh, q is equal to capital c into delta p by rho g and since c is equal to 0 0.03 right and since q is q is also known then we can write 0 0.015 that is basically q is equal to 0 0.03 into square root of root p as you say square root of delta p by rho g okay then it will basically give delta p by rho g is equal to 0 0.25 meter okay. we are asked to find the uh, pressure head so pressure difference head so it will basically be 0 0.25 meter of water since water flows through the duct so it will be uh, 0 0.25 meter of water okay so this is the correct answer so now let us look into this exp uh, this this example okay so we have that uh, just a few seconds uh, I, i'll give you a few seconds to look into the question So, I hope you have looked into the question, but let's, let, let me again still dictate it and uh, tick the important parameters mentioned, mentioned in the question, so we can discuss about it, okay. So we have, a flow section of a laboratory wind tunnel is shown in the given uh, figure below, okay. A total head tube pointed upstream indicates that the stagnation pressure on the test section center line is 10 mm of water okay below atmospheric pressure again that's interesting 10 mm of water below at atmospheric pressure to so basically uh, tells you there's a uh, suction pressure in the uh, winter so there's a pressure uh, below the atmospheric pressure the laboratory is maintained at the atmospheric pressure and the temperature of and a temperature of 277 Kelvin. Determine the static pressure at the wind tunnel test section. Okay. So the the key parameters or key term terminologies involved in this question are the ones that I have already underlined. That is 10 mm of water. Water below atmospheric. So since we know that the deflection of the fluid that the pitot that the pitot tube measures is actually a deflection of the very fluid itself that it, it uh, that passes through the uh, duct 
So in the case of manometer, what happens is that the deflection that we use, the deflection in the fluid is essentially a heavier fluid, so that the net deflection is easily uh, or is compact enough that can be read, but large enough to be detected. Okay, but in the case of pitot tube, there is no such additional or different fluid involved that gives the deflection in the scale. It's actually the very fluid that traverses through the duct that creates a deflection in the uh, pitot tube that is what we measure as the net stagnation pressure okay so the fluid within the pitot tube is essentially the fluid that traverses through this cross section okay so it basically means is that this even though they mentioned as a wind tunnel but since the flow measuring device or the pitot tube here measures a deflection of 10 mm of water so it basically means is that the fluid passing through this duct is actually water that they are measuring in the lab okay so there are this key terminology involved okay if it would have been a manometer then i would have thought that since the fluid is not given i have, now i cannot tell what is the uh, density of the fluid that, that, that we are going to measure because they have not specifically mentioned that there is water flowing through the duct or air flowing through the duct but they have mentioned that there is a 10 mm of water below atmospheric in the pitot tube and we know that pitot tube measures the deflection in the pitot tube is the deflection of the fluid that passes through the duct in which it is measuring the velocity and that's why it is the velocity of the water it is water itself that is passing through the duct okay so the velocity of the water in the duct is 50 meter per second okay so now since we know the stagnation pressure because we know the uh, water head and since we know the velocity of the water flowing through this duct so now we easily find the static pressure because we know that static pressure is basically the difference between the stagnation pressure and the dynamic pressure. Why? Because P dynamic or dynamic, oh sorry, P stagnation would essentially be P static plus P dynamic. Right? And since both of these are known then we can easily find p static okay so let us just go through the simple calculation that i have done that you can also easily do since all the terms are already given but the concept is very important like you may ask that there is no fluid specifically given that flows through the duct and there is all they are all, all, always measuring wind tunnel wind tunnel but the key thing is that since the pitot tube is measuring 10 mm of water it basically means is that the flow the fluid within the duct is water okay so if you go back to the uh, uh, calculations, uh, we get that P stagnation is P minus rho g h. Okay, where P is the uh, static, uh, uh, where P is the atmospheric pressure because they mentioned that P stagnation is uh, 10 mm of water below the atmospheric pressure. So P stagnation would be equal to 101226.9 Pascal. Okay, the dynamic pressure can be measured as half rho v square, where rho is the density of the fluid that passes through a duct. Right, so the dynamic pressure is half into 1000 into 50 square that is basically 125000 pascal okay and that's why the static pressure can be given as p stagnation minus p dynamic that is 101226.9 minus 1250000 is equal to 1148773.1 pascal okay and the key and the key thing that i wanted to mention is that none of the options here gives the correct answer like here also we it should I the correct answer should have ideally been 1148.7 kilopascal. Like if we go back to our calculations, we find that uh, P0 that we found was actually 1 minus 1148773.1 pascal. So if we try to convert it into kilopascal, it will basically 1148.773. 1 kilopascal so now the option is correct but uh, in terms of digits you can say this is correct but essentially this is wrong because this is off by order of off by order of magnitude okay so just to make you aware of it so see the concept is important not the answer right so once you get the cops concept card you will eventually get to know which answer is correct or wrong okay so uh, i hope it is clear so now let us look into the next question uh, question number five okay again it's a very conceptual question that in a certain application a siphon must go over high wall 
can a water or oil of specific gravity 0 0.8 go over a higher wall so see the question is also again very tricky it is simply asked whether a water or oil can go over a higher wall then the answer is simply yes because yes if we use a siphon then we can easily pass the water through the uh, uh, then we can easily uh, drain the water through the tank where the pipe now goes where the pipe now will go above the free surface of the water but important thing is that let me just draw it if there is a tank uh, there is a certain level of water okay, and there is a siphon used to drain the water then it can go above a certain height of wall okay that's not not a big issue but the thing is that the exit of the pipe must be below the free surface of the liquid okay then only the siphon will work but again in real life scenarios this cannot this this height or elevation of the peak of the or the highest point of this pipe can also cannot go very high because there will be very significant losses in this region of the pipe that essentially reduce the mass flow rate of the fluid to this cross section to be equivalent to zero so even if it goes very below since there are very high losses already involved in this region so the fluid will not be able to move up and the net flow won't occur through the siphon okay so this was also very important but just wanted to but since we are in a we are considering a theoretical scenario so this thing can happen can happen so the answer should be essentially be yes yeah the fluid can go over a wall because that is what they have asked no further specifications asked okay so so thus there is no further specifications required so it can go over high wall yes it can go over high wall how much higher it can go they have not asked so no need to bother about that okay so simple answer would be yes yes it can go above uh, a higher wall So now let us look into question uh, 6 to 8 which is a common data type question. So now let us look into the uh, diagram and its corresponding question. Okay. So the question is two identical orifices on one side of the vertical tank are shown in the figure given below. Okay. So these are the two orifices. This and this. The height of water above the upper orifice is 3 meter. So from the upper orifice the height of the water is 3 meter and the jets of water from the two orifices intersect at the horizontal distance of 8 meter okay so they have specifically mentioned that, that these two orifices there are two distinct orifices and are, they are separated by distance h okay a positive distance h assume cv is equal to 1 for the orifice the coefficient of velocity equal to 1 for the orifices okay so this is a diagram the flow, flow is coming out of the jet from the two orifices and they meet at a distance of 8 meter from the orifice okay so the question is what is the velocity of discharge of water from the upper, upper orifice okay so again uh, if i go back uh, this calculation is this velocity of the water discharge from the orifice is again calculated by using the Bernoulli's equation between point the upper surface and the orifice at a height or at a depth of 3 meter but I will not go through the, all the calculations so from there we got that the velocity of discharge it depends can be approximated to depend only on the height of the free surface of the water from the orifice okay from a specific orifice and in this case since the orifice the free surface of the water is at a height of 3 meter from the upper orifice so the velocity of discharge is equal to root 2gh okay and h would be 3 in this case so we will have v is equal to root 6g okay now let us try to uh, evaluate the uh, uh, okay so that will be the answer so v would be equal to root 6g okay so if i go back here so the answer would be root 6g okay sorry so let's look at the second question the second question is what is the vertical distance of point of intersection of the jets from the water level in the tank okay so they're essentially asking 
the value of height h this is a vertical distance of the upper surface of the fluid from the point of intersection of the jets okay so this is the vertical distance this is basically h okay so this is h okay so to do that uh, we apply the principle of kinematics in or equation of kinematics in this example so let us go through it so oh sorry so we apply the equation of kinematics of motion so uh, equation, of, uh, equation of kinematics here so we apply the equation s is equal to ut plus half gt square okay now let u be the velocity of discharge from the upper orifice and t be the time taken for a water to reach point p from the upper surface okay <coughs> then we can write since s is equal to ut plus half at squared and s will be equal to h minus 3 right because uh, the water traverses from a distance of this distance so the net displacement is basically this distance that, that will basically be h minus 3 right so h minus 3 would be equal to half gt squared because you can consider initial velocity of water to be zero that the moment the orifice is being made or the moment the orifice has been opened the velocity just water just oozes out of the orifice so we can take the initial velocity to be zero then h minus 3 will be equal to half gt square okay the acceleration is basically the acceleration due to gravity okay and we can also take ut is equal to 8 because we know that velocity is equal to distance per unit time and since we know the distance already that is 8 meters in this particular diagram right this is 8 meters and if u is the velocity of the jet then the time then the time required for the jet to re to cover this distance of 8 meters would basically be the product of the velocity and uh, time right so we will have uh, 8 is equal to u into t okay now if we substitute t is equal to 8 by u like if we basically substitute use this expression in this equation we will get h minus 3 is equal to half g 64 by u square or h minus 3 is equal to 32 g by u square okay now we already know that for the upper orifice u is equal to root 6g okay so we can write h minus 3 is equal to 32g by 6g because it is u square so it will become 6g now again if you simplify the expressions then we will finally get that h is equal to 8.33 meters okay so the correct answer in the above in the given question would be option a that is 8.33 meter okay so i guess there is a similar question being asked what is the vertical distance between the two orifices okay so now the question is let me go back what is the vertical distance between these two orifices okay so the, i guess the solution will be simple it is now find the uh, find, uh, carry on a similar ex a similar exercise for orifice 2 to find the unknown height h okay so we we'll again take the aid of the kinematic equations then we will get that h minus 3 minus h because now the height the liquid traverse is h minus 3 minus mole h okay because this is the distance the liquid travels so it is h minus 3 minus mole h okay so and but again the distance is same so say u2 if velocity of the jet is u2 then u2 into t is equal to 8 okay so we would have h minus 3 minus h small h is equal to half gt square and u2 into t is equal to 8 okay so if we sub substitute uh, the value of t as 8 by u2 we will have 5.333 minus h is equal to half g 64 by u2 square okay now again if we apply the Bernoulli's equation between the top surf upper surface of the water and the lower orifice we will get that u2 is equal to root 2g and 
into h where h is the distance of the lower orifice from the upper surface which will basically be h plus 3 right where h is the gap between the two orifices so we would have u2 square is equal to 2g into h plus 3 now if you go back into the diagram it will basically u2 u2 into root uh, u2, uh, u2 would be equal to square root of 2gh where h is the distance between the upper surface and the lower orifice so it will basically be small h plus 3 that's why we can write u2 is equal to root 2g h plus 3 or u2 square is equal to 2g h plus 3 then we will have then if we substitute u2 in this expression then we will have 5.33 minus h is equal to 32g by 32g uh, by 2g uh, divided by 2g into h plus 3 okay So now the only unknown term here, only unknown term remaining in the equation is uh, h. So we will have 2g h into h plus 3 multiplied by 5.33 minus h with just do this cross multiplication will be equal to 32g. Uh, if we simplify these expressions and solve for h, we will get that h is equal to either 0 or 2.33. But it is it already mentioned in the question that there are two separate orifices so the two orifices cannot coincide so h cannot be equal to 0 that's why h will be equal to 2.33 meter okay so that's the solution so the answer would be if we go back to the questions the answer would be 2.33 meter okay so now let, let us look into question number 9 so the question they ask here is which of the following statements regarding venturi meters is not true okay it's not true so the first uh, uh, statement is uh, venturi meters cause very low head losses and thus they should be preferred for applications that cannot allow large pressure drops yes why because we saw that the diverging section of the the very construction of the venturi meter is made in such a way that, that there is minimal head losses because of flow separation at the diverging section right and that's why uh, they are very useful in using uh, to measure in using in, in applications where we need to measure pressure uh, we need to measure uh, we need to measure a flow rate where we cannot uh, allow high high pressure drops or, we, uh, or basically where we cannot allow high uh, losses or high inaccuracy so for very accurate measurements venture meters are actually uh, are usually preferred uh, more than other flow rate measuring devices okay there is a rapidly converging section and a gradually diverging section in the direction of the flow to avoid losses of energy due to separation. And the, just as I mentioned, the, the diverging section is being made in such is made in order to reduce the losses in the flow or the flow energy because of flow separation. Okay. The velocity of the flow is maximum in the third section. Yes, by applying continuity equation, we can say that since the area of the flow is least at the throat section, that's why the velocity of the flow will be highest at the throat. In the course of flow through the converging part, pressure increases in accordance with the Bernoulli's theorem. So, given the scenario that we are using the venturi meter to measure flow velocities, or sorry, using use venturi meters to measure the flow rates of fluid travel, traveling traveling uh, in the so, uh, in the subsonic regime, then since since the velocity decreases in the converging part, then the pressure should also essentially since the sorry since the area of the cross section reduces in the converging part then from the content from the Bernoulli's equation we can essentially get that since the velocity increases from the continuity equation then essentially the pressure should uh, uh, decrease as well in order to uh, satisfy the Bernoulli's equation okay so mathematically if you are going to say that say if one denotes the inlet and 2 denotes the throat okay the throat of the venturi meter okay then from the continuity equation we have that for subsonic flows okay we have that a2 v a2 a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 now if a2 is le, uh, is lesser than a1 it basically implies v2 is greater than v1 From continuity very simple now from Bernoulli's equation if say let us assume that a venturi meter is being placed horizontally that the boat 
the ends the throat and the inlet are at the same horizontal level so we will have that p1 by rho g plus v1 sorry plus v1 square by 2g is equal to p2 by rho g plus v2 square by 2g okay now i am saying that v2 is greater than v1 and thus in order to keep this equation conserved we need to have p2 then since this sum is a constant we need to have p2 lesser than p1 so we get that the pressure essentially decreases in the case of a subsonic flow through a converging section okay and that's why this statement is not true the pressure should essentially increase okay it should increase sorry decrease i'm really sorry sorry should decrease decrease decreases as the area reduces or velocity increases most importantly then it should be a subsonic flow okay. so these details of how subsonic flow or supersonic flow, supersonic flow governs this uh, area change parameters uh, we will discuss when if we have if we discuss uh, or if we take the compressible flow course uh, if we take the compressible flow course but for the current course just to know uh, just as a information you just you can keep in mind that, that this analysis or this analogy is only valid is only valid in the case of a subsonic flow okay So the final question is uh, for today's session is water is flowing through a ventilometer through whose diameter is 7 cm and entrance part at the entrance part and 4 cm at the throat. Okay, so the diameter of the duct or the or the, the, in the inlet diameter of the ventilometer is 7 cm and the, the diameter of the throat is 4 cm. The pressure is measured to be 380 kPa uh, at the entrance and 200 kPa at the throat. See? since the area has reduced in the throat the, uh, the pressure has also been reduced in the throat okay that is what we have discussed right neglecting frictional effects again is very crucial that we are asked to neglect the head losses determine the flow rate of water okay so i think this equation is very simple you just need to apply the continuity and the boundaries equation in the venturi meter find the relationship between the velocity at the throat and the velocity at the inlet using the continuity equation Substitute that in the boundaries equation to obtain the expression for velocity and then essentially then find the uh, volume flow rate. That will, that will basically be area into velocity. Okay, so the algorithm would be something like from continuity equation, sorry, from continuity equation a1v1 equal to a2v2. Okay, so either a1 substitute v1 in terms of v2 or v2 in terms of a1 so you can just take v1 is equal to a2 by a1 into v2 and then substitute this in Bernoulli's equation Bernoulli's equation to find v2 and then <coughs> volume flow rate Flow rate can be given as Q is equal to area into velocity. So this is what I have exactly done in my uh, solution. We are given that d1 is equal to 4 cm and d2 is equal to 4, uh, d1 is equal to 7 cm area of the duct and d2 is equal to 4 cm this area of the uh, diameter of the throat. I am sorry. D1 is the diameter of the duct or diameter of the inlet of the ventrimeter and d2 is the diameter of the throat of the ventrimeter. Then we will have P1 at the pressure at the inlet as 380 kPa and P2 at the pressure at the throat as 200 kPa. 
Then if we apply the Bernoulli's equation, we will get that uh, if we take it, the ventimeter to be kept at horizontal, then we will get uh, P1 by rho g plus V1 square by 2g is equal to P2 by rho g plus V2 square by 2g. So since if they are horizontal, then we can neglect uh, this Z1 and Z2. Then from the continuity equation, we will have A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. Then we can write A1 is equal to A2 by A1 into V2 or D2 square by D1 square into V2, right? Because area is basically uh, pi by 4 into D1 square. So if you take the ratio, this pi by 4 term will get cancelled cancel out. Then V1 is equal to D2 square by D1 square into V2. Then we will have V1 is equal to 0 0.3265 into V2. Okay. So I hope this part is clear. Now, if we substitute V1 in terms of V2 into this Bernoulli's equation, we will get that V2 square minus 0 0.3265 v2 square this is which is essentially v1 by 2g is equal to p1 by p2 divided by rho g okay since now we know all these terms we know p1 and p2 and g is already known that is acceleration to gravity and rho is density of the fluid that is water in this case so we will have v2 square is equal to 2 into 180 divided by 0 0.8934 or v2 is equal to 220 sorry 2 v2 is equal to 20.07 meter per second and since we are asked to find the volume flow rate, then we will have Q is equal to A2 into V2, that, that will essentially be pi by 4 into 0 0.04 square into 20.07 to get that Q is equal to 0 0.0252 meter cube per second. I hope the solution was clear. And now if we compare the results to our given uh, uh, options, so we will get that volume flow rate is equal to 0 0.0252 meter cube per second. So option A is the correct answer. Okay, uh, so I hope uh, we got the we uh, we got the basic idea of how to apply Bernoulli's equation on various day-to-day uh, -day, uh, flow measuring devices, day-to-day -day example, these real life examples. So again, these applications of Bernoulli's equation play a very crucial part in understanding the basics of fluid mechanics or get a very basic essence of the beauty of fluid mechanics in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, so though there are lots of assumptions and simplifications involved in this application of Bernoulli's equation in our day-to-day -day life, but still even if there is high level of inaccuracy because of the assumptions involved, they, essen they essentially help us to get an idea of the variation of flow parameters they will actually occur even when the real life scenario, real life conditions are considered. Like even if there are head losses, there is not. The, it is not. It is never possible that in a converging section, if there is a uh, reduction in area, the velocity will decrease. The, the velocity will always increase from the continuity equation. Like even if there are several losses involved, or if from the Bernoulli's equation, if the area reduces the pressure would also reduce because essentially the velocity increases so this relationship between pressure and velocity in the case of a converging section will never change even if there are various losses involved in the uh, real life scenario in the first place so these equations this simplification this simplification simplified forms of our solutions even though may have higher level high level of inaccuracies but still they give us a very good understanding of the real life phenomena that occur uh, when we consider the uh, factors such as frictional losses, uh, head losses, and bends in the pipes, so when we consider these factors, then also we are going to then are, then also we are going to similar trend of variation of parameters uh, when uh, compared to what we get when we take some idealized assumptions. Okay, so I hope uh, I was able to uh, make you understand or uh, relate what Professor Chakraborty told in the lectures and and uh, was able to uh, apply those concepts in solving this week's problems. So, so that's all from today. That's all for today from my side. So I hope you all have a good weekend and let's meet next week uh, same time and good luck. Okay. And good night for today. Thank you.